This is hell. This civilization needs to die. It's made life meaningless and is actively killing our planet with climate change. It's time we move on to another better civilization while humanity still has a chance to survive. Here to talk about our meaningless civilization that's destroying Earth and to help us figure out where we can go from here, Roy Scranton is author of We're Doomed, Now What? Essays on War and Climate Change. Roy was on This Is Hell in 2015 to talk about another happy book he wrote, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Reflections on the End of a Civilization. Welcome back to This Is Hell, Roy. Thanks for having me on again, Chuck. It's Uh, great to be on the show. That conversation that we had back in December of 2015, we got so many comments about it. We got so many people saying that it really made them very depressed, but also gave... (laughs) Also gave them some form of hope, and I think that that is what is going to happen if people read your new book as well. You can follow Roy on Twitter, at Roy Scranton, and you can find out more about Roy at RoyScranton.com. You write, the time we've been thrown into is one of alarming and bewildering change. The breakup of the post-1945 global order, a multi-species mass extinction, and the beginning of the end of civilization as we know it. Not one of us is innocent. Not one of us is safe. In the choices that you see us making, uh, how much do you see them being guided by this bewilderment? Uh, Are our choices and decisions confused and uncertain because we live in confused and uncertain times? I think that's probably a a pretty good take on it. Uh, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole range of things that sort of limit our decision making and limit our, our worldview, even just simple stuff like, you know, a basic human tendency to look to uh, short-term solutions to problems, right? Uh, And then then you add things like uh, a cultural tendency to focus on the short-term, right? And this sort of the capitalist culture we live in, uh, you know, thinking generations and generations down the line is really not, um, it's not rewarded. And so there's a bunch of stuff that's really sort of closed in our view and made it really hard for us to think uh, outside of this moment, which is incredibly confusing and, uh, and difficult and grim and weird. Uh, I mean, you follow the news. I mean, you follow the news every day and it's, it's impossible to know what to make of it um, to the point where people are just Right, self-selecting out the narratives that they want to believe in, and then following those uh, and sort of ignoring contrary data. So there's a lot there's a lot going on right now that makes it really hard for even reasonable, intelligent, thoughtful people to reflect with any kind of depth on our on our predicament. So um, that's really interesting. So. If you are somebody who is on the right and does not understand anybody who would listen to or watch or believe anything that they see on MSNBC, or somebody, conversely, who is a huge fan of MSNBC, they always have it on, who cannot understand how anybody could ever watch Fox News or believe anything that it says, how much do you think that that kind of disconnect that we're seeing right now is driven by climate change and a desire for us to make some understanding that we approve of of the world that we live in today. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting, uh, complicated question. Uh, I, I I wouldn't say that um, the kind of political tribalism at work in the United States now is directly necessarily driven by climate change. I think climate change is one of the major factors, sort of behind a general sense of anxiety and unease. Um, but I think there's a lot, uh, a lot more going on as well, um, including, uh, including the, the kinds of um, globalization and sort of cultural homogenization that has been happening over the last 20 years that have made people anxious to uh, know who they are, right? And to, to be able to say who they are, right? I think that's one of the things going on now behind this kind of political tribalism is is a desire to be able to identify oneself as belonging to a certain group, right? And and doing that by refusing to to accept some other some other group. And it's happening, you know, uh 
it, it's happening all over uh, and all over the political spectrum. Um, and, you know, like I said, I think climate change is part of the background for that kind of tribalism as uh, a, as a, a, a factor of, of general anxiety and, and fear. Um, but I would hesitate to say, like, it's directly connected to that, that kind of, that exact political divide. Although, you know, then there's another thing to say on that, which is a point, you know, Naomi Klein made uh, in, uh, in her book, This Changes Everything, which is that people who uh, are invested in in capitalism and the capitalist status quo are going to have a, a committed uh, investment in denying the truth, uh, denying the the scope and scale of anthropogenic global climate change. Because if you accept that it's tr- if you accept the science and if you accept the consequences of what's happening with climate change, then you cannot deny that we need to completely change this capitalist system. Like it's just, it's because it's industrialized fossil fuel capitalism that's, that's caused it. So uh, from that sense, you know, in that, in that way, climate change may in fact be sort of directly driving the tribalism insofar as it is, uh, it's sort of forcing, um, it's sort of forcing the, the capitalist party to double down on, on their ideology, um, which then provokes the similar response on the, on the other side. So you get, you get Trump versus Bernie Sanders, right. In 2016, I mean, as the two, as the two lively agents in a, in the election. Um, so yeah, I mean, and there's more that could be said, but that's sort of, that's sort of an idea, I think, of, of how climate change is working in the the current political spectrum. I, th- I think there's a lot of people on the liberal side or, in, or farther on the left who be- who are they they don't understand. They're stymied by the idea that uh, of climate change denialism that they see on the right. But you write. Right-wing denialists insist that climate change isn't happening or that it's not caused by humans or that the real problem is terrorism or refugees, while left-wing denialists insist that the problems are fixable under our control, merely a matter of political will. Are left-wing denialists, as you call them, actually in denial, or are they accepting the idea that the world is being drastically changed by climate change, and not only should we do something, but we can do something about it? Or, Or is that kind of addressing of climate change still a type of denialism to think that don't worry i know there's going to be a technology not not to worry we should be worrying but i'm certain a new technology will come along to fix this problem yeah to to me that that's definitely um a kind of a form of denialism uh and let me be specific about about how that's the case uh it's it's precisely in the the sort of the insistence uh, the hope, uh, the faith that it's fixable, that, um, that we can solve it with the proper, uh, technological or market-based solution, right? You just get the right carbon tax and some carbon scrubbers and it's all going to be fine. We just need to organize. We just need the political will. We just need the, the right charismatic leader to make it happen. Or we just need the right legislation. Um, and that's a form of denial. Because, and what it's denying uh, is, number one, that m- significant and catastrophic levels of warming are already baked into the system because of the amount of carbon dioxide that we've already released into the atmosphere. The Arctic is in meltdown right now, um, and there's no stopping that. Uh, we can, we could, you know, with a global revolution in socioeconomic structures, we could slow it down and even even um, maybe mitigate, but there's no stopping um, intense and destructive levels of warming at this point. So presuming that we can, that if we just have the right hope or the right legislation that we can, we can fix it is already a form of denial. But then the second, the second way that this kind of, uh, 
uh, liberal or, and, and sometimes progressive um, um, uh, in, in incrementalism, right, is is a form of denial, is in its faith that the system as it now operates is capable of addressing this global problem, right? Um, that the that the that American democracy, such as it is, and American capitalism, and the the global organizations um, that were built after World War II to help uh, sustain American hegemony uh, and global global capitalism uh, that that those that those organizations are capable of completely gut renovating themselves, right? Uh, that just seems fantastic to me because those organizations are all built around uh, an energy economy that is uh, driven by oil. And we're, we can't talk realistically about uh, solutions or even mitigation or even, you know, slowing down this death train until we are able to talk about complete transformation of the global energy systems off fossil fuel. It is the view then that technology or political will can somehow fix or at least address the worst aspects of climate change? Do you think, is, do you think that's a uniquely American view? And if so, what does that reveal to you about culture and society in the United States? I don't think it's a uniquely American view, but I do think uh, that a lot of the Americans who, I mean, it's a, it's a view shared by, you know, uh, technocrats working at the UN and all, all kinds of nations. Um, you know, it's a view shared by um, other nations who, who are, or people working in other nations who are um, trying to come up with uh, sustainable, renewable energy sources. Um, I mean, there's politics there as well. Um, you know, given that the U S, uh, is sort of the primary agent of the petroleum energy economy, right. Going, getting off petroleum and on say solar, right. That's a political move as well as, uh, um, an environmental one. Um, so there's that stuff, but uh, the Americans that I talk to who hold these beliefs, beliefs, the thing that seems distinctive about that that sector of the conversation is its sort of um, uh, its fervency, right? Like it's it's almost it's puritanical, like uh, it's it's religious insistence that we have to have hope and that we have to have faith in this. And that like, if you, if you dare question, if you dare question the, the belief that we can fix this, then you're, you're an enemy, like you're undermining the whole cause. Um, and that kind of logic, I mean, that kind of, um, political, attitude, that kind of political comportment, right, doesn't seem peculiarly American or, or uniquely American, but it does seem that some, to be something that if you look historically, um, it's something Americans do and have done <laughs> and do again and again and again. Um, you know, we get really, we get really uh, worked up about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you write that as the gap between the future we're entering and the future we once imagined grows even ever wider. Nihilism takes root in the shadow of our fear. If all is already lost, nothing matters anyway. How do you see our actions reflecting any overall sentiment that life is now in this age of climate change meaningless? I think there's a lot of... Um desire for meaning. I think there's a lot of people, and this goes back to that kind of tribalism that I was talking about again, right? Like your life can make sense to you if you like, def if you define it as being against somebody else, whether you're against Trump or you're, you, or you spend all your time owning the libs, right? Like you can, you can 
make your life make sense in that kind of way. But then also you look at, um, I mean, if you, if you sort of take a step back and look at the bigger picture of, of our culture um, and consider, I mean, it's, it's easy to sort of make generalizations uh, talking in this way, but if you look at the, the phenomenon of uh, incels and um, the, all these young guys who are like following uh, a, 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 you know, a moron like Jordan Peterson, right? Um, or uh, the, the, the school shootings uh, and, you know, these shootings in public over and over again, um, all over the place. Uh, these are symptoms, right? These are symptoms. Uh, the, the support that Trump has found uh, among uh, Americans in the middle class, uh, in, in, in the working class, uh, on the coasts and in the flyover states, you know, there's, there's, there's a nihilism at work. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a terror of the void, right. Uh, and of a desire to make meaning, to make life meaningful, even if, even to the point of violence, right. I mean, that's, if words, stop making sense, then at least you can depend on action. You can do something, and that means something. If you, if you kill someone, that means something. Um, and uh, more and more people are making, you know, are making this decision, uh, and it seems to be this kind of um, this phenomenon, right, in our culture that, that seems to be increasing. Um, and then you can find other symptoms as well. I talk about, you know, so TV shows like Game of Thrones or Walking Dead or whatever, or or Westworld. Uh, I mean, you could we could we can do that kind of thing and talk about more specifically, like, you know, um, that kind of cultural symptom. But I think if you if you look at the culture from sort of a medium view, if you step back and you can see uh, a pervasive, pervasive nihilism and and what's more an anxiety about nihilism right a reaction against the fear that this is all meaningless and it goes nowhere right and a desire and an and an acting out uh, in order to create meaning in the world even if even in, and sometimes especially through um through action but you don't have to find that meeting meaning through as you point out, nationalism, sectarianism, war, and racial, and racial hatred, why doesn't that sense of meaninglessness lead to a search for true meaning to life via collectivism, peace, and love for your fellow human? That's hard. <laughs> it's hard, and it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, you know, so I guess two things. One, um, that the I. The, our connection to really universal sorts of values is is quite tenuous, right? And it's it's the project of a lifetime, right? This is sort of we see um, you know religious ascetics, spiritual strivers, people, philosophers, you know, like like Plato, um, the way he presents Socrates, right? Working to help people over years strive toward uh, kind of universal universal ideals that that aren't reducible to tribalism or nationalism or sectarianism or whatever um, because those those kinds of I like committing yourself to those kind of ideals demands a kind of repudiation of one's specific historical embodied territorial ethno religious identity right like if you're committed to like everybody you know everybody deserves equality and we need to love everybody and we need to have compassion for everybody like that's a huge that's a tremendous uh burden and that's a tremendous um uh challenge right because in our day-to-day -day lives right it's it's me and it's maybe the people around me and I got to take care of that and I got to go to work and I got to pay my bills and I have to, 
you know, I want my cable and I have to like, this guy cuts me off in traffic and it's all about sort of me and mine. And those are where my investments are. Those are where my physical embodied lived investments are. And to so, so to say no to that, right. Um, it's like, it's like, it's like Jesus on the Mount, right. Saying, you know, you can only come to me if you give up your parents. You can only come to me if you're willing to die, right? Um, it's this old spiritual idea that the path to wisdom is learning to die, right? And I talk about that in my first book, and I talk about it more in this one. Um, but it's tremendously difficult. Uh, it's not, I, you know, it's, I'm not confident that it's something that will ever, <laughs> will ever take hold in the majority of human beings, right? There's just because it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. You write, scientific materialism, taken to its extreme, threatens us with meaninglessness. If consciousness is reducible to the brain and our actions are determined not by will but by causes, then our values and beliefs are merely rationalizations for the things we were going to do anyway. Most people find this view of human life repugnant, if not incomprehensible. Now, in your opinion, does atheism make life meaningless because I know I'm going to get feedback from atheist listeners and before they send those emails and direct messages I want to make certain I have your response ready can you find meaning in life without religion or spirituality in some sense can you do you think that kind of meaning in life is lost when you are an atheist this is the amazing so this is the amazing thing about being a human being right I'm not sure that we really have free will. I don't believe that we were put on this planet by some god or aliens or uh, I don't know what, flying spaghetti monster, right? There's no evidence for that. Uh, we're animals that evolved out of other animals, and we've been extremely successful on this planet as apex predators, and we've overrun our environment, and we're probably mostly... We're headed for a, you know, a population correction um, that's going to be pretty ugly. Um, but, right, but the thing that we're really good at as humans is, is adapting. And part of the way that we do that is through this, what we're doing right now, you and me, right? We're like talking. We're using symbols. We're using words and concepts to articulate um, and elaborate a model of reality, right? We're participating in a kind of collective storytelling that is the project of culture. We're making meaning. Right now, you and I having this conversation, we're making meaning. And that's what we do as humans, is we make our lives meaningful in order to organize collectively to achieve goals that we could never accomplish on our own. Uh, so yes, human life is meaningless, but it's not meaningless at all because that's what we do as humans is make meaning, right? That's how we organize ourselves together collectively. And so this is kind of, this is the, what hope I have, um, for our ability to sort of get through this upcoming transition to some other existence, um, what hope I have is that we might be able collectively, right, to, to create a new story, create a new collective sense of meaning, right, that's going to help us make that transition in a less horrible way. <laughs> Then it, then it will, then, then what will happen if we, if we don't, if we keep clinging to the story that we have, right? That like technology will save us and everything's going to get better. And our identities are constructed through, um, consumption and, uh, you know, our cars and so on. Like if we keep clinging to that it, and our identities are constructed by race and nationality and so on, if we cling to all that, we're, we're, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. It's going to be very bad because that's, that story is not working. Um, 
so hopefully some we can create something new, some new collective sense of meaning that will help us make this transition um, in in a less less catastrophic and horrible way. Right. And you point out how we need to let our civilization die. Now, that might sound incredibly frightening to people, but have other human civilizations died in the past and humans survived with a new civilization that became something that was inconceivable and completely unrecognizable from the past? Over and over again, right? It's happened over and over again. I mean, that's human history, is the history of failed civilization. Uh, you know, we, you know, sometimes in the West and the U.S., right, we, we have this kind of wig version of American history where, like, we are the culmination of, of civilization sort of building on each other, right? There's the Greeks and the Romans and then medieval Europe and then the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and industrialization. And now we're here and we've, we just, we're the greatest, we're the best. But that's a, that's a, that version of history ignores the fact that, uh, you know, ancient Greek civilization failed, it fell apart. Roman civilization failed, it fell apart, right? Medieval European civilization was, you know, it, it broke apart there, there, and it, and it didn't work and it, it changed into something else over and over again. And this is not even to, you know, bring up, um, you know, various civilizations in Asia or the Americas, right? Um, it's one of the, one of the greatest or one of the most instructive maybe um, locations to look at this kind of transformation is is uh, in the European conquest of the Americas, right? Because you had civil multiple civilizations um, that were completely destroyed by uh, the European conquest, um, and something new happened. Uh, I I don't think it's a great model of how to of how to do that, but um, I think there's a lot to learn there, right? From what happened and how um, how people thought about and were able able to think about the transition. Um, Jonathan, the philosopher Jonathan Lear, has a book about this uh, called Radical Hope, which looks at um, what the the Crow tribe in North America how they were handling the conquest of the plains uh, differently from, say, the Sioux, and what sort of consequences there were for the for that um for a more adaptationist point of view right which the crow had versus a more resistant point of view which the sioux had um and then you know there's lots of other there's lots to say about this and and it's very complicated and um uh but there's a there's a lot uh i think of interest there uh, for us to look at. We are speaking with Roy Scranton, author of We're Doomed, Now What? Essays an, on War and Climate Change. The last essay in your book is really intense, and it's a topic that I've wanted to talk about for a long time on this show. Uh, I found some writers who were writing about it, uh, but the way that you write about it is really eye-opening. You write about holding your daughter, Rosalind, for the very first time as a newborn, and how you cried for joy, and then sorrow, quote, looking out the window over the hospital parking lot, the rows of cars, the strip mall across the street, the flat, ugly, rust-belt sprawl of northern Indiana, box stores and drive throughs drainage ditches and concrete and waste fields that might have once been oak groves, a world in which the landscape had been ravaged and brutalized as a matter of course, and in which any possibility for living in harmony with nature had been evacuated. Birds and bees and frogs were all dying. The seasons were out of joint. And instead of grieving, people were on their phones. My partner and I had, in our selfishness, doomed our child to life on a dystopian planet, and I could see no way to shield her from the future. You said to your daughter, I'm sorry. I told her, weeping as her tiny fingers gripped mine, I'm sorry you have to live in this broken world. How do you reckon your awareness of an apocalyptic future and your, and your partner's decision to have a child? It's difficult. Uh, it's difficult uh, 
negotiating with the um, with a sense of despair that opens up uh, sometimes. It's difficult um, making sense of the choices uh, and the um, the sort of options that are presented to me as now apparent, right, in 21st century um, United States culture, right, I'm, I'm have to think about my daughter's future life in, society tells me to think about my daughter's future life in certain ways, like a college fund and, um, and this and that, and like, what's her career, like, what's her job going to be, how's she going to get a job, how's she going to have financial security, um, and at the same time, right, there's this deep awareness that all this is, is dead. Like this civilization is over and we're sort of going through the motions at this point. Um, and so how to reconciling that is, uh, it's not something you do once and then it's, it's done, right? Like it's a, it's a constant process. One of the things I keep coming back to, uh, actually is uh, from another essay in the book. Um, in 2014, I went back to Baghdad for Rolling Stone um, and uh, wrote about it in the magazine and, and the version in the, in the book is, uh, is the like director's, the writer's cut. Like it's a much longer version of, of that trip because it was a really important trip for me. And part of that <clears throat> was talking with people who lived in Baghdad, uh, poets and writers and uh, students uh, and cops uh, and all kinds of people uh, and even, you know, I talked to one guy who had come to the U.S. He'd gotten a visa to bring his wife to the U.S. And when he found, when they found out she was pregnant, they decided to move back to Iraq, which just, I mean, it seems like that's a crazy idea. But he found the U.S. so uh, racist and uh, and so disconnected from where the meaning in his life was that he would rather, he wanted to raise his child in the place where he felt connected to life, where life was meaningful to him. Um, and then other people I met, I talked to, you know, one poet, especially who, you know, he'd been thrown in prison by Saddam and he was so excited when the U S came, um, that he was dancing in the streets. But then of course that whole, the, the U.S. invasion and occupation uh, basically was a, a load of crap in the end, uh, and he's profoundly disappointed and very pessimistic. And yet, what he told me, one thing he told me, I asked him, like, are you, are you hopeful about Iraq's future? And this is 2014, you know, things had been going okay, there was a new election coming, but ISIS had just emerged. And there was a real question about what happens now. And he told me beyond the, he told me he wasn't hopeful, but that beyond hopelessness, past hopelessness, there is a new kind of hope that opens up, which is a faith in, in the tissue of human existence, right? That basic tissue of human existence our connection to one another, our ability to persist, our ability to persist in even the worst conditions, our ability to make joyful, meaningful, rich lives in the shittiest, worst places, right? Human beings have lived on this earth for like 200,000 years, human beings, modern homo sapiens, right? And only for the last 50? Have we had, in, in the U.S., right, have we had this kind of pattern of living that we think is essential to happiness? For most of human existence, like, life has been pretty, you know, pretty gritty, pretty, pretty scrubby, right? Uh, so, and, but there's no evidence at all to suggest that people before now were more miserable than people are now. In fact, uh, you know, some evidence suggests uh, just the opposite, uh, you know, that this, that our modern technology, right, has actually made us 
less happy than we were when we had uh, simpler, simpler lives. Uh, so, you know, the future is the future is inescapably grim, but uh, I do have hope that my daughter can have a rich and meaningful and w- worthwhile life even in those conditions because because that's what human beings do but just so, to be just to be real quick uh, clear real quick you're not saying that we have to retreat to an earlier time to all of a sudden start acting like 15th century human beings i want to make sure that because in your <laughs> in your book you're in, in your book you say no, we can't I, let that we can't let our creativity to be dulled or to be ignored we need to move forward but that still might bring us to ideas of our past, correct? That's right. I mean, it's more to the more to the point. It's not that I don't think we should. It's that we can't. You just, I mean, we can't. We literally cannot go back to the past. Um, it's just, you know, I mean, it's 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 not even it's not feasible and or it's not even possible, right? In so many ways, not least of which being that. Um, you know, 500 years ago, there were probably, I don't know exactly what the number is, but there were uh, probably around a billion people on the planet at most, at most, right? And now there's seven and a half billion. Um, So like to live the way people lived 500 years ago is, it's not possible to have this many people on the planet live that way, right? Um, the only way this many people can live on this planet is with modern technology. Um, so there's going to be, you know, something's going to happen. Uh, some There's going to be some kind of, there's going to be transition, there's going to be, and there's hopefully there's going to be innovation and creativity thinking through and working to make this transition um, less to make this transition a change and not a total collapse into, you know, brutality and anarchy. One last question for you, Roy. Always an enjoyable and happy, fun time conversation with Roy Scranton. <laughs> Roy Scranton Thanks. is author of <laughs> We're Doomed, Now What? Essays on War and Climate Change. Uh, you can find out more about Roy by going to RoyScranton.com, and you can follow Roy on Twitter at Roy Scranton. One last question for you, Roy. And as always, it's our question from hell, the question we hate to ask. You might hate to answer. Our audience is going to hate your response. You write, to be honest, though, having a child hasn't really inspired me to acts of self-sacrifice in the service of abstract and doubtful goals. Rather, the ob- opposite. I've had to start thinking about schools, health care, housing, and investment in whole new ways. I feel a deep obligation to provide for my child's future within the constraints of contemporary American society, which demands making some kind of uneasy peace with America's brutality, hierarchical, racist, and individualist culture. This is how young radicals become middle-aged liberal hypocrites. My love for my daughter is overwhelming and irrational, and consumer capitalism exploits that every day by whispering, screaming in my ear that if I don't do everything I can to make sure my child has more than yours, more whatever, the best whatever, and that then she's going to fall behind. The immense engines of capital I have learned possess a formidable array of forces that only activate once you've had children when they fall on you with the force of a thousand suns. So does having children then make you more complicit in the problems that cause climate change and reinforce institutions you believe need to be destroyed to save us from global warming's worst consequences? It does. It does. Um, it. It's it, all Roy Scranton's fault. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was already complicit. We're all already complicit in it. There's no. I mean, as I talk about elsewhere in that essay, the only, the only morally pure position on climate change is, uh, you know, to to commit suicide, right? Because that's the only. That's the only way to like zero out your carbon footprint. <laughs> um, so we're all already complicit, but yeah, and yeah, like having a child does uh, increase that, doesn't complicate that, and and entangle it more. Um, you know, but then it's a question. It's a question, and and this is part of what I'm trying to think through in that essay is like. Uh, 
you know, how, what does it mean? What do we need? What does it mean to make human life meaningful? What do we need to make human life meaningful? And if the only, if the way we decide to make human life meaningful is to, to eliminate everything that that we are built to find important, then then what kind of life is that, right? So, um, if, you know, if, if the way to make human life meaningful in relation to climate change is to give up having children, right? Like, what does that mean for us? It means we're giving up the idea of the future. I mean, like we're trading... We're trading a possible future without climate change or with less climate change for the idea of no future at all, because it's children who, right, take humanity into the future, right? Uh, if we give up children, then we're giving up on the basic st structures, uh, the, the biological cycles of human life. Um, and we can, but if we you know again, if we, if you take that line of thought, then it ends in a kind of self immolation, and that's a position against which I, you know, I can I I I have no defense. Uh, it's it's a frightening and an awesome position, right? Uh, you know, and and. And and I and I say that like with full awareness of of the reality of it because this this uh, lawyer David Buckle right uh, did this in April of this year he went down he lives in New York uh, he's an LGBT attorney and he went down to Prospect Park and lit himself on fire and the notes that he left said that he did it because because of climate change as a protest against our inaction and so. He made that decision, and I, I have nothing but awe and respect for that choice. I can't do that. I can't make that choice. I'm, I'm in this. I'm committed to this world and life in it, complicit and complex as it is. Right. So I have to give up on moral purity because I can't go that far. You know. So what I can do though is do the best I can to live ethically and to teach my daughter to live ethically in a broken world, right? To, to work toward uh, helping to create a, a new culture that can make this transition to um, a, new, a new world. Um, you know, I can commit to that. I can do all that. Uh, and... And that's all, but that's all I, you know, I'm still human, right? Like I can't, I'm still, I'm still trapped in being human. I'm not, I'm not the Buddha yet. <laughs> <laughs> so ask me again when I'm, when I'm 80, we'll see. But uh, for now I'm, I'm still, you know, muddling through like everyone else. Uh, Roy, it is always a pleasure speaking to you. I know that the content of that might not have been all that pleasurable, but I, I found our, I always find our conversations very enlightening. Thank you so much for being back on This Is Hell, Roy. Thanks for having me on, Chuck. It's always a pleasure. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.